This is a main hustle media podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Jackie O and you're listening to Militantly Mixed. Yo, this is Rashani from the single simulcast. And when I'm not making you laugh or making up parody songs, I'm kicking back. Listening to Militantly Mixed. Hey y'all, welcome to Militantly Mixed, the podcast about race and identity from the mixed race perspective. I am your host, Charmaine, aka Mixed Girl Maine, the busiest mixed race bisexual polyamorous atheist comic book nerd cat mom podcaster in this podcasting game. I think I'm finally back. I know that the show has been back from hiatus for two weeks, but up until today, I haven't really felt like I had my podcast and mojo all the way back. Uh, but this last weekend, I had sort of a podcasting blitz <laughs> and uh, I was a guest on a couple of shows. I recorded a few interviews for my show and I think also getting to talk about blurdy shit and movies and stuff like that with my Padna on Blurred Comics last week, Blurred Vision, I think kind of got me back to feeling normal. So I feel good. I feel back. I am ready and glad to be podcasting again. Um, this week, my guest is Jonathan Davis. He is the moderator of our Facebook group for Militantly Mixed. Uh, he stepped up a couple months ago when I started requesting it on the show that I was looking for a fan moderator of the page. And he's already started dropping discussion posts and things like that and engaging with folks in the group. So it's been a tremendous help and I'm really excited to actually see more participation in the private Facebook group. So if you'd like to join that, you can just go to facebook.com slash groups slash Militantly Mixed podcast. And uh, you'll be able to request an uh is it an invite? Request permission, I guess, to join the group. Again, that is a private group so we can have protected discussions about our mixed race identity or whatever we want to talk about related to mixedness without the prying eyes of other people who know us looking through the groups that we support. So Jonathan stepped up to do that. And I really, really appreciate having that support. I cannot tell you. But I wanted to introduce him to y'all. So I asked him if he'd be willing to come on the show. And he was nervous. At first, he wasn't quite ready. And then he sent me a message last week saying he was ready to 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 share his story with the audience. So we got together and got to do that. And I'm really glad that I'm going to get a chance to introduce him to y'all. Uh, one thing I do want to point out about this episode is partway through. So Jonathan is black and white biracial, and he grew up in the South, predominantly with his white side of the family. And at one point, he's talking about not being accepted as black from the black kids he was growing up around. And I sort of interrupt him for a second to say, like, I never had that experience. And in listening back to it in editing, I kind of feel like I didn't express myself correctly there. And I feel like it doesn't, it doesn't quite jive with the rest of Militantly Mix and how I've talked about myself. So I did kind of want to clarify a point. Um, I was, I think I was concerned about sort of the regional aspect of this as I tend to have a lot of black and white biracial Southerners express to me that black folks don't really accept them. And not, not in every case, but uh, it's been enough of a case for me to notice it at this point. And when Jonathan and I were talking about it, I said, I've never had that experience, so I don't really understand or something to that effect. And that's not quite right. It's not that I've never had a black person express me not being black enough, maybe, but I've never directly had a black person tell me you're not black, which is what we were talking about in the moment, him being told he wasn't black. Um, in the South, it's the only time in my life a black person did kind of call me out on being open about my mixedness. Uh, I think I've told this story on the show before. We were in the Atlanta airport. I was standing next to my Japanese grandmother. I walk up to the counter. This little kid looks like he couldn't have been a day over 16, looked at me and said, what the hell race are you? <laughs> And I said, black, Japanese, and white. And he said, you tell people? And I said, yeah. And he goes, don't do that. And I was like, what the fuck you know? Like, I didn't say that, but I was basically like, what the fuck you know? You're just a kid. Like, you don't know shit about my life. Um, So that's like the only time that I can really recall a black person being like, nah, don't do that. Um, but most of the time, my blackness is acknowledged and in many cases accepted as me being able to be my black ass self. Uh, but there has been times in my life where I have been made to feel not black enough. I've just never been made to feel not black. So that was the point I wanted to clarify. 
I don't know if it's that important to the rest of the audience, but in listening back, it, it kind of became important to me. So I wanted to make sure I clarify that. Uh, I am going to be releasing a bonus episode this week because I got together with Natalie from Some Kind of Brown and we had a little chat about the Prince Harry, Meghan Markle stepping aside from the royal duties and the treatment of Meghan Markle in the British media. Um, I haven't addressed it on this show yet because of some feelings that I have as a mixed black British American myself. Um, but we get into that on that. So I'm actually going to be releasing that tomorrow. Uh, we did it sort of as a cross collaboration thing. We're going to release the same episode on both of our shows. But of course, she has her intro and I have my intro. So you might want to check out both sides because maybe we'll say some different shit. So that's actually going to come out tomorrow, which is Wednesday, uh, for those of you that are interested in that. I didn't want to release it as a regular episode for the week because Militantly Mix is predominantly about the mixed race experience from the perspective of an individual mixed person. And this is two mixed people talking about somebody else that's mixed. <laughs> So I'm going to count that as a bonus episode this week rather than a regular episode. So if you want to check that out, you can do that. I do kind of explain and break down the line of succession and the British uh, royalty relation to the rest of the people a little bit in there. Um, so for that, the way in, in, the way that I understand it as a mixed black British American. And so if you want to check that out, you can go ahead and do that tomorrow. All right. So as you know. Militantly Mix is a fan-sponsored podcast, and with your support, it really does help me keep this show going right now, specifically because of, you know, I've talked about it, things that are going on in my personal life. I would not be able to put on this show without y'all's your your financial support, uh, which I am insanely grateful for. Uh, we are currently sitting at $311 a month, and I have a goal to hit $500 a month um, for regular support, monthly support of the show. If you would like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash militantly mixed and i will put a link to that in the show notes or there always is a link to that in the show notes and you can support the show as low as a dollar a month to as high as anything you wish um there are different reward levels depending on the level that you donate at uh you can also opt out of rewards if you like and you just want to support the show and i'm not kidding i can't tell you it is such a relief knowing that that's coming every month because it really really does take uh takes the burden off of me trying to figure out how I'm going to pull the money together every month. Uh, so I really, really do appreciate it. Appreciate it. If you don't want to contribute to a monthly sponsorship, but you do want to contribute to the show, you can go to paypal.me slash militantly mix and drop some coins in the PayPal account. Both go into the same militantly mix bank account. Everything goes back into the show. But, um, but those are the two ways that you can sponsor the show financially. Additional ways that you can sponsor the show is to either go to our Teespring website or the Etsy shop. And I do apologize that I have shops in two different spaces, but the Teespring shop allows us to do print on demand for t-shirts, tote bags, mugs, what have you. And the Etsy store is for stuff that I actually have in my possession at home <laughs> to send to you if you purchase. So if you want to go to the Etsy stop shop, if you want to go to the Etsy shop, uh, you can pick up enamel pins, the mini buttons, and the three inch vinyl stickers on that shop. And I'm going to get a couple things up there a, or a couple of additional things up there soon as well. Um, but those get shipped directly from me to wherever you're at. So um, that's one way. Or you can go to teespring, T-E-E -E spring.com and search for the Militantly Mixed store there. And you can get t-shirts, hoodies, tote bags, mugs, all kinds of little things on that page as well. All the proceeds do go back into the show and help continue to keep this ball going. So those are the ways that you can sponsor the show financially. The other ways you can support the show, as always, is to follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Militantly Mixed. And, you know, share, retweet our episode tweets, tell people about the show, and go on to however you listen to the show, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and review the show on those podcatchers because that does help as well. Uh, and, and in a different kind of way, another way you can support the show is to email me <laughs> because I have been getting the most encouraging and awesome supportive emails from y'all lately. And I, I think that's also contributing to me getting my mojo back. I, I really do appreciate it. I swear, I, I feel like I have the best fans on the internet 
internet and um, also that the listeners that do respond to me or send me messages and continue to do it, like repeat, repeat responders, it uh, it really does feel like a sense of community finally um, since starting this show. I've been wanting to feel like I was in a community and I do now and that is all because of you. So I hope I continue to tell the stories that you want to hear and you're craving or telling your story if you're ready. And if you are, please email me at Charmaine at militantlymixed.com. That's S as in Sam, H-A-R, M as in Mary, A, N as in Nancy, E at militantlymixed.com. And let me know if you want to come on the show or just, you know, send me a chat. I also got a couple postcards last year, which I thought was pretty dope. I really like handwritten mail. Uh, so if you're interested in dropping some postcards or anonymously sending a postcard so that I can read it on the air, whatever you want to do, uh, you can send those to 11 to 09 National Boulevard, number 343, Los Angeles, California, 90064. That is the militantly mix. What are they called? It's like a post office box, but not from the post office. Uh, you can drop some mail in there and, um, and I can read it on the air if you if you tell me to read it on the air. All right. I think that's pretty much it. I'm looking forward to sharing this episode with you and. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Jonathan Davis to the Militantly Mix family. I actually have a guest and we're back to normal. And I'm really excited to introduce to you all someone who stepped up for Militantly Mix in a big, bad way. This is Jonathan, a.k.a. the moderator of the Militantly Mix group on Facebook. Welcome, Jonathan. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm your moderator. I'm from North Carolina. Uh, I'm, my father is black. I'm mother is white so i'm biracial <laughs> um i'm 33 years old and that's about me that's about you <laughs> well first of all i i mean i know we've already talked and things like that but i'm really excited and grateful that you stepped up when i put that out there that i was looking for a, a fan moderator to help support the pages on facebook because i was starting to feel overwhelmed by all the extra uh work that kind of goes into the social media aspects of the show and things and I just put it out there, did not expect it to really hit. And within, I mean, I think it was the very next day you sent me a message. So I'm just, I'm really appreciative that you, that you did that. Yeah. I don't even think I got all the way through the episode before I messaged you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's yeah. get into it. I know that you're feeling a little, a kind of way. Anyways, I'm not going to put words in your mouth about, um, you know, getting into it and being your full mixed ass self, but safe space. Let's, uh, let's start talking about it. All right. Um, how do you want to start? I, well, I mean, where are you at? You, so kind of when we, sp when we first spoke, you were sort of saying that, um, I guess I, if you don't mind me kind of doing extending your intro a little bit, when you and I first talked, we talked about how you were raised around the white side of your family more than having access to blackness or black people. And so because of that, you have said things to indicate that you don't always feel and if I'm putting the wrong words in, definitely interrupt me, uh, like you don't always feel permission to be mixed. Yeah, you're definitely right. So um, let's start from there. Like what got you from feeling like you don't always have permission to express your mixedness to wanting to get involved with Militantly Mixed and, and by extension, like investigate your own mixedness? Um, let's see. Well, I guess it's one of those things, you know, you've always known you're mixed, but it's uh, you kind of push it out of your head for a long time mm -hmm. <laughs> or something along those lines. You think you're just normal. But um, yeah, so I mean, my, it's your normal. Yeah. right. <laughs> so my dad was never really around. My mom got pregnant. I think she was 
like a senior in high school mm. and this is the south so that didn't go over so well right and for in hindsight i can understand kind of maybe why he didn't stick around but so that was never really an option like there was there was a kind of a black father figure my mom's boyfriend when i was a kid that was around for a while so i had some access to blackness mm-hmm. um i'd say like early 90s <laughs> did you feel and like then, even with his presence you still didn't get to own it because he wasn't your biological father I don't think I really truly understood being mixed. I mean, I knew, you know, I was like seven years old. So the neighborhood I grew up in was predominantly black. And I remember being around seven years old. And then, you know, some kids telling me like, you know, you're not black. You're your mom's white and that kind of stuff. And so that, that kind of, you know, it lets you know you're something's different, but you don't fully understand it. Um, hmm. mom, so the black kids were telling you you weren't black. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that um, a Southern thing? I got I got to say, because I don't have that experience like East or West Coast, L.A., black people. I haven't had the experience of being told I'm not black. And yet I've had a lot of guests that have had that experience, um, usually Southern, sometimes East Coast. Um, well, I guess the Southern part of East Coast, that makes more sense. And when I saw it on Mixed Dish, they did it also on an episode of Mixed Dish, where it was the black people who said to Rainbow and her siblings, like, what are you mixed with? And it was so bizarre to me. They said it with like, ick in it, you know, not really just like, oh, what are you? Like, my my experience on the West Coast is black people look at me and say, what you what you got mixed up inside of you? where it's kind of like a acknowledgement of my blackness, but what else is there? And then I hear with guests, and and of course I saw it on Mixes too, this flip of that, which is black people are like, you're not black enough. I've never experienced that. So I'm trying to figure out if this is a regional thing or if I just was in a weird magical place that was super okay with me being a yellow presenting black girl. If I had to guess, I would assume it's regional because I feel like if you're from, say, New York, if you're any shade of brown, you're kind of accepted as black in a way. True. <laughs> like, yeah. Down down here, yeah, there seems to be a bit more of a line in the sand. I've always said, like, I feel like at some age, if you're mixed, you pick a side and that's where you're stuck. Mm. That's how I feel about it. I don't know. You know, I've never had this conversation with very many other mixed people. Right. But, yeah, there's a line in the sand and you're... You're you're always bounced between like you're always the black kids don't think you're black and the white kids don't think you're white. So you kind of get in where you fit in. That was kind of my experience anyway, as I kind of went into survival mode. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty much and this is kind of shameful, but I was kind of anything that would fit. You know, if a kid assumed I was Hispanic, then sure, let's go with that for a while. (laughs) I mean, shit, that's survival, right? Like, I don't blame you for for that. If um, if people are willing to accept you and other people aren't, it makes sense to go with the people that will accept you. Yeah, that was always my experience. And when I was 10, my mom remarried. She didn't remarry, but she got with a new guy and she had my younger brother and sister. So they're half Mexican. So culturally, I was raised Mexican as much as I was black. Like, oh, funny. Okay. I've played more pickup soccer games than basketball in my life. Mm. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, so do you feel like um, do you feel like you were raised kind of transracially be- with the Mexican? Like, were you immersed in the Mexican culture, or was it just sort of Americanized Mexican? No, I mean, it was pretty, I feel like it was pretty traditional Mexican as far as, you know, every, every night it was tortillas and beans and rice Mm. and meat and that kind of stuff. And on the weekends, you know, they got, had get togethers and people played soccer or they just hung around and talked and did like their little party thing. So So in that, in that way, it was pretty traditional. It would be, I guess, the same as if they were back home. Yeah. So you are kind of transracial in addition to being mixed. So that's like culturally you're. You're kind of white and Mexican biracial. Yeah. Like, I've never, I've kind of always been one of those people that I fit in everywhere, but I've never truly fit in anywhere. Mm-hmm. And like, like you said, culturally, I'm kind of Mexican, but when people see me, they typically think, I think I present as black. I've honestly never asked anybody. Uh, you read to me as either light skinned black person or I would, but when every time I see a light skinned black person, I wonder if they're actively mixed or passively mixed, as in, Gen- it was in the generation somewhere and you just popped out light skin, right. you know, so I like my first go to would look at you and be like, 
my first sentence would probably, oh, he's mixed with black. And then my next sentence or my first sentence to you about that would have probably been, do you identify as mixed or are you monoracial? You know, that way I'm not making assumptions of how somebody identifies. Right. That's one of those things I'm still kind of figuring out myself. Like, I'm not sure how I feel about the term mixed. Like, okay, it's not a, you know, I wish we had a better term. <laughs> okay. And, and at the same time, you know, it, you're half black and you can present as black. But, you know, I'm from a white family. I have a white mother who's the white family has been predominantly in my life, my entire life. And you don't want to kind of disregard half of yourself. So you don't want to really say you're black. Right. But and like we said, regionally, it depends on who you ask down here, whether I'm black or white. Some people base it on your father. Some people base it on your mother. <laughs> yeah, that's actually really interesting how some people, uh, some cultures are like that. So because here in the States, it actually flipped from your mother to your father. And, right. and so in your case, I guess the South kind of does that to you, too. Well, I mean, society here does it to you anyway, because if you even code remotely black, you're going to be treated like a black person. Right. In jobs and cops and all that kind of stuff. Right. And that was one of those things I didn't realize until later in life. As a kid, it's kind of insulated. Like I said, you're growing up with an all white family and you go places with white people. So that's really the only experience you have. Like most of my racial racist experiences, the what I guess you'd call trauma, like it's more in hindsight seeing like, oh, this is what that was and this is what that was. And it was because I was black, not because I'm just unlikable or anything like right. that. So yeah, I grew up kind of in a in a bubble of like I heard I mean, my family's pretty traditional as far as being southern, so I I heard, you know, racist terms and all kinds of stuff growing up in, in all, your family was, at um, you or around you no nah, around me it was one of those it's that thing you know that we mean everybody except you kind of thing mm. so yeah so <laughs> that just contributed further to the like you know i don't fit in but i don't know what i am because they talk about these people this way but i'm not they don't think i'm those people mm-hmm uh, yeah, it creates a bit of an identity, like split kind of thing. <laughs> right. So when you and I talked originally, you had said something about kind of trying on. I don't want to say personalities because that's not the right word. What was it? You were like trying on different uh, subcultures to fit in where you could. Right. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, like I said, I grew up pretty traditional Southern grew up hunting, fishing, all the typical country stuff and then yeah once i realized something was different i started to move towards like oh well you know there's like punk rock culture and stuff like that i kind of found that accidentally and realized that there's kind of white people that aren't as popular as the normal white people either <laughs> so yeah i kind of went and hid in that mm. lived, lived in that space um i rode bmx bikes and hung out with skateboarders and stuff like that growing up and so in that in that kind of subculture, it's not really there. Black people are few and far between, but your race really rarely comes up. It's more of a, you know, we do the same thing. Therefore, we're the same and we get along. And it so, makes sense that you would find refuge in a in a space like that, too. Like if they're not calling you out for your otherness, your racial otherness there, we're all others because society doesn't appreciate us. Right, exactly. It was easy to hide or easy to live there and kind of flourish there and find yourself because race didn't come up that often. And so it, it definitely made it feel like a safer space to kind of come into your own. And there there are a few black kids sprinkled here and there and mixed kids mm -hmm. along the way. But like I said, they're few and far between for the most part, especially down here. Mm. So you, do and, you still, are you still a punk? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> that's how i would say it okay yeah, i feel like it's more of a mentality it's more of a lifestyle than it is you know dyeing your hair pink and right. wearing leather pants or anything like that and that was kind of what i figured out it's more of a mentality it's you know it's, of sort of being uh, on the outskirts of mainstream culture yeah, it's kind of, i mean for lack of better words it's it's kind of a fuck you like 
we don't fit in and that's fine. <laughs> so, right. So yeah, that was definitely a place that I was able to really find myself and it came along pretty well, I think. <laughs> and did you have, like, did it help you with confidence in any way, shape, or form? Like maybe not necessarily multiracial confidence, but like in general? Yeah, it helped with, I think it helped with confidence a lot as far as it was that thing of like, you don't fit in and now you you're in a place where you're not supposed to fit in. So it's okay to be uh, quote unquote weird Mm -hmm. or different. And what word gives you power? Do you feel like you have power in those words? Um, and what weird, weird or different. So like for me, for example, I really hated every time people would let me know that I was different because I was like, I didn't have the language for it, but at the time, my I, I was thinking something to the effect of, "I'm not different. My whole family's like this. Y'all are different." It had I had to leave my house to you know to like find people different from me, but I was always the different one growing up, and I hated it. And um and so as a late teenager, early twenties, kind of I started to say weird, like I know I'm weird. But it wasn't like weird the way, or at least I felt like I had some agency in that word because it wasn't like I was using weird, like, you're weird, I don't want to be around you. I was weird and it was interesting and I wasn't going to let anybody other me. I was going to other myself, I guess. Uh, And even now, as a 42-year-old, that has altered again. And so now my view is, is the people are different from me which gives me a little bit more power, right? So if I'm in a neighborhood where it's all white people, even though I'm in the minority, I'm still looking at them as the different ones. I'm not the different one because I got to live with myself. So you see, like, is that for you? Do you have a word, if not mixed, if not weird, if not different, do you have a word that gives you some sort of power? I don't think I do necessarily. I I don't have a problem with weird. I think most of the time, like, that's why I kind of said, quote, unquote, like, I think weird is a good word. I think mm-hmm. I grew I grew up avoiding anything that made me feel different, which was pretty unavoidable. Mm-hmm. The different was a like a bad word. You didn't want to be different. You didn't want to be called weird. But right. that was kind of through that, like, punk soap culture and everything that you realize weird was weird was a powerful thing. Like. People may not weird puts you like it's like a billboard, you know, the person if you read somebody as weird, you int- immediately read them as, like you said, interesting or avoidable. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, yeah, weird kind of is I guess you could say weird was a power word, because now if I say somebody is weird, I'm typically using it as more of a term of affection or a compliment. Yeah, I, I affection. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so weird. It's weird how that became a term of of affection because I find myself being attracted to people in friend spaces or whatever that I view as weird. I'm like, you're so weird. I want to know you. You know, like that has become something sweet now to me. Yeah. As my girlfriend right now, like. I'll say every now and then I'll be like, you're weird. And she'll kind of shriek at it. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm with you because you're weird. (laughs) Yeah. Right. That's what makes you so interesting. Right. No, I think it's a, I think it's a good power word. Yeah. At this point, I feel like all the best people are deemed as weird. Mm -hmm. That's fun. I mean, anything that gives you any kind of power or agency is important. I, I think, I mean, as mixed people, or multiracial or multicultural, however, multi-ethnic, whichever word is the thing that makes people more comfortable, we have to own something. Like, people decide for us everything. They decide if we have to align with one side more than the other. I mean, especially, I, I'm different because I'm, bi- I'm triracial, but, like, I hear this with biracial people all the time. If you look more like you're brown and you don't claim you're brown, you hate your brown. But no one's ever saying, why don't you claim you're white? What do you hate? You're white. People are just so willing to just let you be your brown. But if if they're like you grew up around white people and you don't really know you're brown, how can you claim something you don't really have that much access to? And why should you be held to that responsibility? Right. Yeah. Because there's plenty of times as a kid, you know, you became the spokesman for all black people. And you're like, I don't 
really even know any black people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. that's a lot of pressure for a kid. Like I think we discussed before, like as an older person, I realized that, you know, being black and being Southern have a lot in common. So that does give me a a bit of insight into Mm -hmm. things like that. And as you said, like as you get older, you experience the world as a black person. So now I can speak more on those things. But at that age, like, what do you say? Right. (laughs) I know what a responsibility you're seven years old and you have to speak on behalf of all black people. (laughs) Like that's, that's a lot. Um, so let's get into a little bit as to like what started making you investigate your mixedness because to go from, you know, not having access to one half of you and then adopting a new culture because it was given to you, you know, you come into your adulthood and it seems like you, you look one way, but you feel a different way. How do you decide to go from the childhood confusion of your mixed identity to I'm going to start looking on the internet. I'm going to start engaging in community. What got you there? Um, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people give the same answer, but I arrived at that frantically searching on the internet one night for anything mixed. But I don't, it's kind of a weird, cheesy answer, but Obama. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, because... Like I said, because I representation like, matters and you saw yourself? In a way... I, I definitely saw myself and I didn't I didn't understand how he was going to be perceived mm. because, like I said, I grew up sort of insulated in that. Like nobody, nobody else close to especially was ever outwardly racist or anything like that. There's definitely things I look back now that are problematic, but nobody was outwardly racist. Um, I think if any even like a family friend were to do anything kind of racist towards me, like my family would react probably violently. Mm hmm. But yeah, so 2008, I guess I'm like 22. I'm starting to get into the world as a as an adult man, mm-hmm. starting to kind of see, you know, that the world does kind of see me as a black person sometimes. And sometimes they see me as a white person, depending on who's there. <laughs> so when Obama comes along, I think like, oh, this is perfect. You know, he's half black. He's half white. Nobody's going to be able to say anything. He's not racist. He can't be working more for one side. This is going to be perfect. And then <laughs> and then life. <laughs> and then, yeah, then he won. Then the reaction. Then the it was like, holy shit, this is what they see me like. Mm-hmm. And I've almost completely abandoned this whole half of myself. And it looks like the world expects me to be there in a way. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, what is that? You know, I I dealt with like depression and anxiety and stuff when I was younger. Felt always felt like something was missing, and that was kind of the point where it hit of like, maybe that's what's missing. Maybe maybe you've neglected half of your entire being for all these years, and maybe it's left a hole. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of the intro into it. Was well, I'm I'm half black, so I have to go find all these things about being black now. Mm. And then that was. 22 i think now we're rolling around to 34 so over like a 12 year period it's evolved more into the last couple years especially since finding the podcast and everything it's become more of a no you're not black but you're not white you're mixed and it's okay to be both of these things Mm -hmm. it's okay to kind of coexist like you don't have to flip from one side to another Mm -hmm. like i used to complain sometimes when i was younger that I felt like I wore costumes because mm. one day I would be like, you know, kind of skinny jeans, medium t-shirt, like, you know, mm-hmm. look like a white skater kid. But the next day you didn't feel that way. The next day you wore like baggier jeans and bigger t-shirts and you felt more, you felt more black that day. Mm. And it always made me feel kind of like inauthentic. Like you have to pick one of these sides, you know, like they want you to pick one or the other. Right. So you were worried about your identity through other people's eyes versus how you believed you've felt yeah i think i've viewed myself a lot through other people's eyes trying to understand well now realizing that i was trying to understand why people treated people the way they did Mm. and because like my mom always told me when i was a kid you know these people there are people out there that don't they don't like people of other races there's people that are going to be mean to you but those are those people are dying away (laughs) kind of thing (laughs) that's that's cute They didn't really die away, unfortunately. Right. So growing up, it was always, you know, those people are dying away. These people are going to be mean and that's okay. They're going to go away. This is not always going to be a thing. So mm. don't, you kind of let it go. It's like, yeah, that's fine. They're, they're going to be gone soon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
But yeah, then you realize all these people are going to be around forever and you have to figure out who you are in order to survive those people. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you have permission to just tell people what you are versus letting them decide for you now? Now, yeah. When I was a kid, I definitely would let because it, you never knew what people perceived you as. So it became an easier way to just be quiet and let them guess mm-hmm. and then kind of play it appropriately from there. Because, you know, there's really only three cultures here in the South. There's, you know, there's white people, black people and Hispanic people. And I knew my way around all three. So whichever you decided was what <laughs> the card I would play. <laughs> <laughs> Again, survival, chameleon, whatever we, we got to do to make it through. Yeah, exactly. And now if you ask them, yeah, I'm mixed. I'm half black, I'm half white. That's who I am. Do you prefer the term biracial versus mixed? Or what? have you decided what term you prefer? No, I can't 100% decide on what term I think would be the best. Like, I like mixed. Like I, like I said, I don't necessarily like mixed, but I feel like mixed is probably the most acceptable because I feel like if you say biracial, then it kind of eliminates, again, it kind of others, you know, people like yourself who are more than five things. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm cool with people claiming the way that they are. Like, there's a lot of people who will call me biracial and then I'll clarify that I'm triracial and they'll, they'll look at me with the kind of squinty eyes like, yeah, that's not a thing. You know, like, it's weird to be three instead of two or four, you know, something that's easy to divide. Um, So, like, I'm fine. Like, if if I'm totally comfortable with what people decide is their thing. Like, I've had some people tell me that they don't like the term mixed, and it's the term that I do like, so that's why my show is called that. But um, I don't feel like that one's forced on me. But when someone says, um, you know, I'm multiracial or I'm multiethnic or I'm biracial i'll adapt to whatever the person's thing is you know like i want you to be what you are like what you feel the most comfortable with so um like for me i'm mixed and or triracial or more multi-ethnic either of those work for me but- yeah i think most of the time when anybody asks i just immediately say i'm mixed biracial seems i guess a little scientific <laughs> yeah i guess so. also here in the states biracial only means one thing which is what you are black and white right, like they right. don't give room for biracial people here that are asian and white or for latin and white and you know and that's kind of been my thing is trying to find something that's inclusive of all of us because as a whole we're a community regardless of if you're biracial or triracial or mm-hmm. any other percentage really yeah and honestly pick one gets really weird regardless of whether you're two things three things four things like it's it's so hard to just like it's just so uncomfortable to um try to figure out who am I giving up today you know like for me I've always been more comfortable in blackness and then secondarily comfortable in Japanese-ness and then I like to claim aspects of my British whiteness although I have a lot of problems with my British whiteness like I really struggle with the history of them um yeah I feel like as somebody that's half white from the South, I can definitely identify. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like... <laughs> it's a real weird thing to try to have any sort of pride. <laughs> yes, like, uh, it's so... I have this complicated relationship. I've been trying to work through this lately, and I've been talking to someone about it. But I have a really complicated relationship with the Union Jack. Because as a flag... God, I hate I'm about to say this out loud. I haven't really said it out loud, but I'm going to say it out loud. Uh, I think it's cute as hell. <laughs> I'm so mad at myself for saying it. So I have a bunch of shit around my house that is the Union Jack. I have teacups and fucking stuffed things that are dressed in a Union Jack. Knit patterns. Like, uh, I just, I like it. I have it over. But there's nothing more colonial than a flag. (laughs) And in particular, a British flag, right? So, like, I like my Japanese flag, too. When When I did own a house, I painted a rising sun on one of my rooms because I was like, this is my my people and stuff. (sighs) But with the British flag, like, I have this thing of, like, I really like it, and I put it on shit and then I look at it and I'm just like that's like colonizing like that's that's what happened to my people like I'm only mixed because a white person got on a boat and went to Africa and was like you'll do and dragged them to America you know like uh, I have such problems with it and then my other white my mom's side's white is like early settler Irish Scottish German mix 
came here in the 1700s and have been West Virginians since, right? So they're like uh, before, they're the white people that were here before America, <laughs> right? you know? And so like, that's another thing too. It's like, you just stole land from people and was just like, yeah, this is ours now. And then my other, other people literally carted people across the ocean and was like, you're going to work for us now. And I have to sit there and be mixed with that and be pro black like I'm hella black even though I don't look it you know and I so I have a lot of conflict internal conflict and stuff I, I imagine being a oh, mixed southerner <laughs> has that same kind of thing because like it so I think this is the thing I hate to say it the way I'm about to say it but like it's easy to celebrate your blackness when you're an American because we didn't do anything wrong we got picked up and brought here right but it's really hard to be like I'm a real proud, like, early settler West Virginian, you know? Like, no, <laughs> I can't. I can't do it. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. You know, I'm, it's just ugly. I don't know. It's really hard to deal with it. So, uh, yeah. I've, I've tried to rectify those two truths, and it's it's really hard to balance. Like, half of my ancestors were, like you said, were carted here and forced to work. And then another half of my ancestors kind of settled the place and brought those people here to work. And then, you know, they also tried to overthrow the country at one point. <laughs> right. Yes. And like, as much as you say that whole thing down here, you know, there's the argument that it's for heritage. It's just like, yeah, but at the same time, that heritage was owning people. Like, yeah. So heritage or not, there was still hate involved. And you have to decide, are you going to be cool with that? You know, I mean, right. even on my Japanese side, the Japanese went to China and Korea and did horrible, atrocious things to Chinese and Koreans. Mm -hmm. So when I see other Asians and we're all like, what kind of Asian are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm Japanese. And I get the stink eye. Yeah, fucking duh. You know, like, I get it. My people did some hardcore things to you. Um, you know, and then you get that whole, like, it wasn't me type of thing feeling. But that's not, that's not helpful. You know, it's like, we're, uh, it, there is a lot of ugliness in our heritage. And you want to know what it is just so that you don't do it again, right. you know. But at the same time, it's like really hard to know that you have these multiple conflicting cultures rolling around your blood and you're just going to be like, what am I today? You know, <laughs> like sometimes that's what it is like. Sometimes it is, what am I today? Yeah. And there's some days you just can't be anything, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know about everybody else, but for me, that battle gets strenuous over time of constantly trying to, like you said, trying to argue those two points with yourself of how do you, how do you, how do you live with this and be proud as a person, but also know all these things? Yeah. You know, you just kind of like, I don't know, start from scratch and be like, I'm a product of all these things, but they're not going to own me or control me. And I'm going to enter at whatever access point I decide for myself and, and then roll with that until I feel comfortable and, or until I feel uncomfortable and then try the other thing. You know, or <laughs> whatever. I think that's really how I've I've survived over the course of my life. Um, I I feel like a lot of people, like you said, especially if you're biracial. I think maybe more so if you're biracial than than um, mix like me. Is that you, it's like you got one or two sides. Pick one. It's easy. What do you look like? Go with that. You know, like things like that. I think people really believe that that's that that would be easy for us and we would just be totally fine with ignoring the other half of our family. Right. And I think especially in cases like you, which is, a, you know, I've had a lot of guests that have the same thing. Uh, they're biracial, black and white. They were raised by their white side. They may or may not have had access to blackness. The world is perceiving them as black and treating them as black. And then when you don't code black, they're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And you're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe maybe I was raised by white people and that's what that's why I don't know either. You know, it's really unfair. Uh, the expectations that get set on um, biracial people, I think, in particular. I think when, in, in the case of me, it's more diluted. So it's like, yeah, you can be whatever. You're black. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Be black. I know you got a yellow face, but yeah, you're black. Why not? But I think in your case or people that are similarly mixed to you, you get a little bit more heat by choosing to identify as mixed or not coding as how you're perceived. Yeah. And I remember being younger and like, like you said, I, I was in this delusion that it was kind of a choice. You know, you have 
like you said, there's two things. Choose one, and I thought that I got to choose that somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and no I one's telling you, so no one's explaining yeah, like, it to you. Yeah, in my family, like it's not something that was ever talked about. I mean, outside of like I said, when I was younger, I was told that some people weren't going to be necessarily on board, and from there, I thought, you know, I have a white family and I do everything with white people. So I'm, I guess I choose to be white. Like black mm-hmm. people didn't like me in my experiences. So obviously they don't think I'm black. So maybe, maybe I'm white. And I stayed in this delusion where I kind of pushed so hard to be not necessarily pushed hard to be white, but I kind of separated myself from anything that seemed black because growing up, you no know, access to black people. You, the only things you do here are kind of like a lot of negativity. And so you're like, well, I guess being black is bad in a way. So I think especially from like 10 to like 16, I kind of pushed really hard to like separate myself from blackness. I, I wouldn't listen to like hip hop music or anything like that. And mm-hmm. I, would, I didn't want anybody to even call me black or mixed or anything. I just kind of wouldn't acknowledge it. Mm-hmm. And looking back, there's a lot of kind of shame and probably a lot of things to still process in that. Mm-hmm. Like especially, especially there was, there's this one moment that like, I feel like it was the deal breaker. At, I feel like all black people so like were done with me at this point. I would have been, I feel like, mm-hmm. but we had this, um, we had this class in high school and one of the teachers was trying to prove a point. I can't remember his whole point, but he's basically had everyone stand up and he kind of lists off these characteristics of people. And he's like, you know, if, if you're under five foot tall, sit down. If you're a woman, sit down. If you're, and then it gets to the point of, you know, if you're not white, sit down. Mm. And at that, at that point, it left me and one other guy standing because in my head, I'm from a white family. I'm a white person. <laughs> oh. And I just remember this girl that kind of had a crush on me, like the look on her face of just disgust. Mm. And, and it was just like looking back it's like that was such a bad moment like that was you're so like delusional to think that this was a whole choice thing and that was kind of what took me all the way around back to 2008 and Obama mm. and that, <laughs> that but, thing. I'm like oh this is definitely not a choice because but to the be fair to yourself land. you were in high school right up yeah. until that point you're almost entirely exposed to whiteness mm-hmm so your lived experience is telling you that this is correct. And unless you're looking to a mirror, how often are you aware of what you code as, right? You know, like your lived experience up until that point was telling you that you were white. And it took the facial reaction of somebody outside of you who disagreed to cause you shame in it. You should right. be forgiving of yourself of that moment, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where it's more a recent realization, and like I said, hindsight's twenty twenty. You yeah, know, those moments of like, oh, this was a wrong move. <laughs> I mean, I totally like get remembering it with discomfort and things like that, but I'm just, I hope that you're not continuing to punish yourself for that reaction because it's not like it's not like if Kanye today just stood in front of a church and told everybody I'm white now, which I fully expect him to do at any moment. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be like that, you know. <laughs> like, that's not the same thing. You had everything telling you you were white, including the lack of seeing your biological black father every day. So like your lived experience up until that point was telling you that. I think as an adult, that might have been a weirder thing because the world would have reacted to you like a black person. And and um, and so if you were to do that, say at 30, it might be like, really, dog? Because people are going to look at you and react to you like you're black. But in high school, how much of that did you have? You probably hadn't had much of that yet. No, not at all. Because there weren't that many black people in my high. I mean, it was probably, I'd say maybe 20% black and probably 10% Hispanic and everybody else was just white Mm -hmm. country, country people. Country. Okay. And like race and stuff like that didn't come up a whole lot that I remember in school. You didn't have like race fights or anything like that? Yeah, we didn't have stuff like that. Really? You would have. You would have things where people would get in fights, but typically it didn't cross racial lines very often. Hmm, that's kind and of I, awesome because every place <laughs> I've ever been had race fights. 
<laughs> well, it's kind of like I explained it to other people down. Like, it seems like down here, I feel like in the other part of the country, black people truly are a minority, but not necessarily down here. Down here, it's pretty close to 50 50 in the grand scheme. Of oh, things. gotcha. Okay. So uh, I always feel like there's like a, like a tenuous understanding, like, yeah, this could get out of hand if anything turns to that <laughs> oh that's a totally different way of looking at it than i ever would have thought because like i mean the numbers are pretty close you know <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the weirder things about this is this is where i felt like being mixed has always been unique kind of getting to be the fly on the wall in some of these conversations that monoracial people have without thinking about you <laughs> mm-hmm. but i've always found that there's an underlying fear to white supremacy or at least to like racist mentalities there's an underlying like they think they're better than certain people, but at the same time, they would never by themselves have a confrontation with anybody of another race. Right. So I think that's kind of what keeps it in balance in a way. Yeah, I could see that. And that, I mean, and honestly, as I got older, <laughs> you kind of learned to work that in with your mixed raceness. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, these people, they might think they're better than me, but at the same time, he's a little afraid of me. So It's a yet another survival instinct mm-hmm. for mixed uh, mixed people. Was the girl who had the crush on you, who looked at you, was she white or? She was black. Oh, she was. Oh, you, that's right. Because white would have had to keep standing. OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like a turn your back on us look. And that's the thing that sat with you for years. Yeah, she, I just remember like this audible gasp that she had like oh like he's not and she cut herself off but she, you know she mm. was gonna say he, he's not white right <laughs> and she was she was right i just didn't know that at the time i mean first of all the experiment is flawed and that teacher should not have done that <laughs> because it's it's kind of like outing a gay person you know that you don't do that shit And a mixed person has a very similar coming out to a degree. You know, we have to tell people at some point, (laughs) sometimes. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. I've always kind of said, like, I can identify with the gay culture in that way. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're mixed in a way... You don't have to put out what you are. You can pass for whatever they find acceptable. Right. And then if that needs to shift when you're in a different space, you can shift it and continue to pass. Like we we have that skill. Like I've always called it coming out as mixed. And actually, that's that was one of the first episodes that I had recorded with a person as I had posted when, before I started the show. I had posted on, on Facebook groups all over the place. And I was like, um, do you have a coming out as mixed story? Like... I want to talk about what this is like for people. And um, the person that responded, uh, Jules, he he was my seventh episode, but my first interview, he was like, seeing those words coming out as mixed clicked for me (laughs) that that's a thing I have to do. And I mean, I don't feel bad saying that. I don't feel like I'm taking anything away from the LGBTQ community because I have had to come out as a mixed person and come out as a bisexual person and come out as a polyamorous person. Like I, I have coming outs all over the place. So and they feel the same. They always feel the same. I feel invisible right now. So I have to come out to be visible, you know, Um, as a mixed race person who looks the way I look, I don't have a definable race. So unlike you, where someone will look at you and just decide you're going to be black today and that's how they're going to maneuver with you. People look at me and they don't know. Um, because I don't look like anything. I look like all the things. So they can't decide for me. So they have to ask me the damn question. (laughs) And I have to decide if I'm going to do it or not, answer it or not. You know, Um, it feels exactly the same of when I have to tell people if I'm, uh, I was about to say if I'm straight. (laughs) Those words didn't feel good at all in my mouth. Uh, (laughs) You know, if I had to tell people that I'm bisexual or whatever, or defend my bisexuality when I am with my primary partner who is a man. So it feels exactly the same to have to come out for both those things. So I I think it's fair to say that we have that. I've definitely had those moments of, like you said, coming out as mixed or coming out as black, more small scale moments. I feel like now the last few years has been my actual coming out as mixed lifestyle. But yeah, in every relationship you have that moment of you do realize I'm half black, like, Mm -hmm. you know, because down here that can be a problem still today somehow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) People don't change. No. But yeah, there's been those moments of have to come out. And yeah, it does. I don't feel like it feels that different than coming out as gay to a friend or, you know, it's this Mm -hmm. moment of I'm going to tell you something that you may not like. 
Yeah. And it may change our entire dynamic from this point on. Yeah, exactly. It's so trippy that that is even a thing. Because I love this moment of up until now, you loved me and everything was cool. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's different is knowledge. Because I was still the same, like in my case, I'm still the same mixed ass, half a gay ass, polyamorous person. But if I come out as those things and the person doesn't receive it well, then they have got all these oh, it's like I don't know you and you're a stranger and blah, blah, blah. No, I'm still the same exact person. Everything that informed the personality that you enjoyed was me being mixed and being queer and being, you know, polyamorous and stuff like that. For just the mixed race aspects, same shit. (laughs) You know, like everything about my personality that you liked until now was informed by what I'm mixed with and you've just decided you're not comfortable. Yeah. That's the only thing. I've I've had people in my life for years and only when I began to like push that I was mixed that our relationships began to kind of shift. It was like as long as I kind of lived in that space of just whatever they wanted me to be, then everything was fine. (laughs) But once you start to push back or once you come out as who you truly are, all Mm -hmm. of a sudden everything's different. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's pretty screwed up. And somehow black has always been a bit different than anything else. Like I've in my experience I've had girls along the way who were who you know, when you're younger your parents have say so or an opinion on things. Mm-hmm. And there were certain people who it was okay if I if they thought I was Mexican or Hispanic, but if I was black, then they weren't allowed to date me. Mm-hmm. Kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. I've never, I've never fully understood what, what that was a hard part growing up and figuring out like what is so different about being <laughs> right? black, <laughs> right? <laughs> like so- seriously, and. You have no say in the matter. Like, this is the thing about having to exist as a mixed person. We did not pick this. We just are this. So don't get mad at me if I embrace this thing that I had no say in. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just showed up, you know? <laughs> I just showed up. That's it. Like, my ticket got pulled. I showed up. That's it. That's it. Um. Yeah, that's rough. <laughs> It's so stupid. So, it's so crazy to think that just not that long ago, like, it was illegal here yeah. for me to just show up. Like, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, I remember when I was a kid, there was a movie filmed in my hometown that was kind of about, I think it was called Love Field. Oh, I remember Love Field, yeah. So, yeah, that was filmed in my hometown, and that was my first, that was one of my first experiences of like, oh, this is what this could mean, like, black people and white people. (laughs) This is what, in my eyes, I guess, this is what my parents could have dealt with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not that long. So, I'm, um, are, are you familiar with Loving versus Virginia? A little bit, yeah. So, in my case, I'm 10 years after Loving versus Virginia. I was born 10 years later. So, my parents, who are both biracial, technically were illegal right. when they were born. The only reason why no one got in trouble is partially because they were on the West Coast and it was um, those rules weren't as uh, strongly enforced in California. Um, but they had the military pass. So, that was always a way you could get around it if you were in the military. You could be a white man, leave here, go get yourself a yellow bride and come home. And then your kids now became, they were half breeds, but they were essentially white. They got to be white. But on my grandfather's side, on my dad's side, it was, he was a black GI and he went across the pond to get a white woman. <laughs> so <laughs> like that wasn't That would not have been okay, except that he had the military pass. He got away with it. So what happened was they just kept him in Europe for a while. You know, my parent, my dad was born in Germany. His brothers were born in one one or two of his siblings were born in Germany as well. By the time they actually get to the West Coast, things have loosened up a bit. But um, but they uh, they were technically illegal in, in the country. So I'm shaped by that. Like, I, rem- I remember being unusual, like, that you're just walking around in the street out in the open about being mixed. You know, like, that was never, in my time, that wasn't really something that people were ready to talk about. And by the time I start talking about, like, as, as I become a teenager and everything in the early 90s, and I start talking about it, it was starting to get cute. So it went from being, like, illegal to, okay, but don't talk about it. To, oh, that's cute. <laughs> you know, like all within my pre, like from childhood to, to teen, you know, time or whatever. 
And now I feel like it's fine to be mixed. But the thing that's happening right now, the pushback is that um, it seems like culturally the, you know, white mainstream is kind of like, well, we don't want to go full black. So we'll go ahead and be okay with the mix, people. So, you know, bring me a Halle Berry or bring me, uh, you know, Lenny Kravitz or some, you know, someone that we can digest and then um, and then go from there. And so as a result, it's pitting monoracial black people against mixed people. And so we're starting to have that fight, which wasn't really a big fight when I was growing up. Like it wasn't really a thing. And now it seems to be a lot more pervasive uh, than it was before, which is unfortunate. But, you know, it'll run its course and the next thing will pop up. You know, the next thing that makes it difficult. We're coming to the end of our discussion. Do you feel okay about uh, about talking about it publicly? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I think it's been a good thing. Um, <laughs> Hopefully it helps somebody out there who's doing that frantic midnight cert. I mean, that's the story. Every, the, almost every email starts out with, I was feeling isolated and in the middle of the night I googled mixed race and you popped up. So I think everybody's story ha- has a, pl- like your story will affect somebody the way whichever your first episode that affected you was, you know, did, and it's just going to keep spilling out. I mean, I'm affected by everybody that I speak with too, especially, especially if I get to learn something. Di- well, it's a flip thing. If someone is exactly like my situation and they say something that I experienced, I'm like, yes, I wasn't alone. Uh, when they say something that's totally different from my experience, I'm like, oh shit, we're not a monolith. You know, like <laughs> that, you know, it's, it's, inter- it's, it's, uh, important for me to know how things are for us like it's i i value knowing that i need to know that and so i started the show and now i get access to that information so i think it's important at any level at any entry point if you're still uncomfortable with being mixed all the way to you're hella confident and you're just like i'm gonna be mixed and you're gonna deal with it whatever part of that spectrum that you approach militantly mixed with or come on a show or whatever i think is valuable and i think somebody needs to hear yeah that was a big part of me getting involved with the show and everything because you know with- we're doing that frantic search in the middle of the night and at some point somebody's got to step up and be the people who are there for them to find you know we yeah. like you said we're not a monolith and you get tired of seeing so many people who seem so isolated you're like no there's thousands of us there's we're so everywhere. many of us <laughs> if we could just find a place to meet up facebook <laughs> that ends up being the place <laughs> Yeah, I wish you could bring everybody in and just be like, look how many things that yeah. are, you know, our unique problem that is so widespread. Right. Like every week or so on some forum, I see something about hair or mm-hmm. something about my complexion. And it's like, I've, we've all been through this. It, it's a process, of course. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm 33 now. I think I've had my hair figured out for maybe three years, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like, I go back and forth with it, too. We got the, this is the thing. You know, it would be so much easier. Maybe it wouldn't be. I don't know. But, you know, like, there's black neighborhoods like I grew up in. There's Japanese neighborhoods like I live in now. Um, you know, there's white neighborhoods all over the place and there's places that have a little bit more diversity but there's no like everybody who lives here is mixed like we'll never have that experience of being like oh you're in the biracial town you know like there's not a thing like that for us so we have to find a different way to access community and luckily right now we have the internet that has been able to be a space that brings us together and through that we can find ways of connecting in person with folks and I mean, I've been lucky enough to to actually do that a little bit more now because of the show. Um, I think with your help on the Facebook group, I've already seen people actually starting to engage. I've had that group up for a while, you know, um, and the and the regular page even longer. And I post something and maybe someone will comment here and there, or if it's funny, maybe someone will comment. Uh, but it hasn't really, I haven't been able to click with the people to get them to take that plunge and type in the group. And when you post it as often as much, I think. And then when you posted your first discussion post, it, and it lit up and there was you know, seven, eight people in the first day, it was like, that's it. Like that was that thing. There was just something that needed to to happen. That was maybe, I think it helped that it wasn't me, you know, because I'm not the be all end all of mixedness. I'm just the person that pressed record on this show, you know, and having you there to, to be another voice. That's like, 
yeah, what's what happened to you? What was your mix thing that made you aware? I think that was a big deal. And I really I'm really glad that you're doing it. And um, and then I have a partner in this right now. I think that's amazing. Yeah, ultimately, that's the goal. I mean, I want to bring everybody together and, like I said, have these conversations. But I think more importantly, I want to have and hopefully without traumatizing or opening up anybody else's wounds in the process. I know that's kind of a tedious matter to walk that tight. Yeah, road, it's a like, risk. It definitely is a risk. But but you want to ask those questions that like you've wondered. We, we've all kind of wondered those things. And you just want to ask finally, like, when did you realize you were mixed or what was your experience with this? You know, it's mm-hmm. just one more that deeper level of we all have these problems that feel so unique and so isolated and so lonely. And it can be so depressing that you need to know, like, everybody else is going through this, too. Well, mm-hmm. we got through it. Like you see, you can see people at different levels of their their journey of figuring themselves out. Like you have people who are like yourself in your 40s and I'm in my 30s and you still have people who are 16 and 17 still figuring out just realizing that they're mixed and that this is going to be a thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, you just want to ask those tough questions, hopefully give somebody an upper hand, you know, Mm -hmm. hopefully be that mixed kid that you were wished you would have had to give you that little bit of advice. So you didn't feel so lost. Yeah. So hopefully with those discussions, we can reach that point and hopefully everybody stays engaged and I don't offend anybody in the process. And if I do, hopefully they let me know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think um, I think the way you you entered was great. Like you proposed a question. That could and you posed it in a th- in a way of saying like it could have been great or it could have been bad, but what what was the moment for you? And then you immediately expressed your own, you know. So you didn't just say like give me your secrets, you know. <laughs> like you yeah. put yourself out there too, and I think that that's an important aspect of that. Is it's just like listen, this was my deal, um, and I feel really alone in it. What's yours? Oh, we have this thing in common. Great. Now we are two people that are not alone in this because we both have this experience in common. I think that is huge. And and over time, as the group grows, <laughs> I try to say both those words at the same time, we'll, uh, you know, we'll eliminate some of that isolation and and um, and help build confidence. I think that's I think that's a really important thing is that we should be able to be confident and ex- accepting ourselves however we want to accept them. I think that's important. So with that in mind, since we do talk about some of the hard stuff, let's end on a high note. What do you love most about being mixed? I think after 33 years, I've finally found years of feeling bad about being mixed or at least indifferent. I think I'm I'm proud. I feel like we're unique. I feel like we get a front row seat at so many different conversations that Mm. people don't necessarily maybe wouldn't necessarily have in front of us or you know because we are a bit ambiguous sometimes as far as presentation and sometimes people will start talking and don't realize who they're talking in front of and i feel like that's almost like a being mixed can feel like a curse sometimes in certain situations but in those situations it feels like your superpower like Mm -hmm, i know i know what you really think Uh, i've heard your conversations we're like the 007s of uh of racism (laughs) (laughs) yeah kind of i mean i've always felt like it may have been a bit of (laughs) i've been a little idealistic but i've always felt like mixed people as you said we don't want to save the world but we can be that bridge of like hey, I've been black and I've been white and, you know, this is what they're saying and this is what they're saying and you have more in common than... That's the main thing I've realized throughout life and that's why it does feel so unique because you you realize how much people have more in common than their differences, even the things they complain about in each other. Right. It's still the same things. Like, every family has, you know, the mom does this and the dad does this and so I think being mixed race, I think that gives really a unique front seat to, like, just how the same and how connected people are regardless of their race. Yeah. If we could just look past that thing, we would realize how much more in common we have. Yeah, so much. It's such a surface issue. It's such a... It's literally a surface issue. <laughs> there's nothing biologically different about us. It's literally on the surface. Yeah. I mean, definitely knows. culture. Once you get further into culture, there's obviously differences, but like skin. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, every day where we wake up, you know, we go to work, we come home, we spend some time with our family, and we go to sleep, and everybody really does that, but nobody wants to act, everybody wants to act like they're so unique and so mm-hmm. different. Yeah. And I feel like maybe, hopefully, 
also to make people get to see behind that curtain just a little bit more than ever other people. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, thank you again for, um, well, thank you again for jumping on and doing the, the moderating of the group because that is like a huge lifesaver uh, situation for me. I really appreciate it. But I'm also glad that you came on to share your story. I think it's nice for people to meet you so they know who their moderator is. Um, but I know it's a little bit difficult for you to, to do it. So I do appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. And hopefully everybody will be seeing me and having more discussions. We'll see where it goes from here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we'll just be our happy little mixed ass selves. That's all we can do. <laughs> Militantly Mix is a main hustle media podcast produced and hosted by me, Charmaine Fury. Music is by David Bogan, the one you can follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Militantly Mixed. If you'd like to become a sponsor of Militantly Mixed, please go to patreon.com slash militantly mixed for monthly sponsorship or paypal.me slash militantly mixed for a one time only donation. And if you like what you hear on Militantly Mix, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to be your mixed-ass self. Main Hustle Media. Turn your side hustle into your main hustle.